Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Kyle, this is Pastor Haley, uh, we're the lead pastors here at Transforming Life Church, and thank you for joining our online uh, Good Friday worship experience. Uh, we just want to take a few moments and just reflect on Jesus, all that he did for us, what all this weekend um, that we're going into uh, really is, is all about, and we want to do that with you all out there, whether you are TLC family out there, or maybe you're watching and, and you, you go to another church, or maybe not at all, we just want to say thank you joining us as we celebrate Jesus and all that he's done uh, for us. In just a few moments, we're going to have a time of worship, uh, followed by some communion. So go ahead, grab some communion elements, whether that's uh, bread or crackers or whatever that is. It uh, doesn't matter. Uh, maybe it's, it's juice, maybe it's tea, maybe it's water. Um, that, that doesn't matter so much. What matters is that we take this time to remember all that Jesus uh, has done for us. And so after that, Pastor Haley is going to lead us in some devotional thoughts as we lead into uh, this weekend of Easter, but, uh, but let's go ahead and let's worship together. Come on. Lord, you're worthy in heaven. Lord, we worship you. We worship you, Jesus. You deserve all the glory and honor and praise. All that you are. All that you've done. Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? All the world can come to him and have the sins removed. Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? Sing, isn't the name? Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Son of God, Son of God, one of us, lover of our soul. Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Come on, sing eternal King, eternal King. You will reign forever, and we will sing the glory of your name. Be lifted high for all the world to see. Your name is all we need. Name is all we need. The name of Jesus. Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Chains are broken when it's spoken. Every knee must bow. Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Eternal King, oh, eternal King, you will reign forever. And we will sing for the glory of your name. Be lifted high for all the world to see. Your name is all they need. Yes, your name is all we need. Eternal King, eternal King, you will reign forever. We will sing, and we will sing all the glory of your name. Be lifted high for all the world to see. Your name is all they need. Name is all we need. Cause there is freedom in the name. There's healing in the name. Oh, there is power in the name. Salvation in the name. There is life in the name. There is no other name. But Jesus, Jesus, yes, there is freedom in the name, there's healing in the name, oh, there is power in the name, salvation in the name, yes, there is life in the name, there is no other name, but Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, to 
Jesus. In the name of Jesus, all we need. Is in the name of Jesus, all we need. He is the way. He is the way, the truth, and life. The only way to God. Is in the name of Jesus, all we need. Come on, sing, Eternal King. Oh, Eternal King. The blood of Jesus, no 
We're going to take communion as a TLC family, but also with your own families in your homes tonight. And this ordinance that we observe is from the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples before Good Friday, before he, he died on the cross. And uh, communion is a time for us to remember why Jesus died for us, and that was to cleanse us and provide a way for us to come to him. It was an amazing act of love and through his sacrifice, we are assured forgiveness and eternal life. And Je Jesus partook of this meal with the disciples, but in that moment, they didn't even fully realize what this really meant until after the resurrection. So right where you're at, go ahead and grab your bread, your cracker, or whatever you're going to use for the bread, because we're going to go ahead and get going with that. And in 1 Corinthians... 11, 23, 24, it says that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was portrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, for is for you, do this in remembrance of me. Father, we ask that you would uh, be with this bread, that you would um, help us to remember what this bread represents, that it was um, how your body was broken for us on that cross. Father, we, we do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name. Take a minute to get that bread down. <laughs> so let's take um, your juice or your water, your tea, whatever it is that you have, that you're going to represent that. And in 1 Corinthians 11, 25, 26, it says, In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, Proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we uh, we just pray over this, this cup, Lord. We ask that um, we would remember that this blood represents our healing, Father, that there's power in this blood, Father. And let us remember this as we partake. In Jesus' name. Sing that chorus once again. Oh, precious, oh, precious is the flow. We sing. Sing it one more time, oh precious. So precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other bound I know. It's nothing but the blood of Jesus. No, it's nothing. And you know, I know this weekend we are celebrating the hope and the joy of the resurrection um, Sunday and Easter, but for now I want us to just pause and take a moment and simmer, if you will, in what happened on Good Friday. Um, Easter we'll talk about on Sunday, Pastor Kyle will, will deliver an amazing message for that on Sunday, but tonight I want to focus on the events of what we call Good Friday. 
and a lot can happen in a day. Um, this Good Friday, there was a lot that happened to Jesus on this day, and, and especially physically, and, and it could be defined by Jesus probably as like worst day ever when it comes to physically what he went through on this day. Um, after he had the Last Supper, which we just celebrated with communion, uh, he started praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then he was interrupted by uh, being arrested by the Jewish council and then put before a phony trial um, and a secret trial at that in the wee hours of the night. So he probably didn't get much sleep due to that. And then early the next morning, uh, they took Jesus to stand before Pilate, um, who was the Roman governor of Judea, which is where Jerusalem was located at that time. And um, they took him there early because they wanted to get their business done before they needed to do the Passover that evening. And, um, you know, so, so he's already tired from that, and now he's being drugged before Pilate to, uh, you know, go before him and, and see if he's false, falsely accused, or if the charges against him are true. And so he goes there, and, and Pilate's like, you know, he investigates and he questions him and doesn't find any fault with him. So he's like, you know, I don't find any guilt in this guy. Um, but once he learns that he's a Galilean, he says, well, let me, let me take him to, to King Harold and... Let's see if he can give any insight into this, because maybe he knows him a little bit better, seeing that's his hometown of Galilee. But uh, he goes to Harold, so now he's gone to Pilate. He goes to Harold and talks to Harold as well, and Harold says, you know, I don't, I don't find any fault with him either, and then sends him back to Pilate. You know, they didn't have cars back then, so, you know, he's going there, coming back, going there. So now he's tired on top of all of this and going back and forth. And I, I think Pilate was really really wrestling with his decision that he was making here. I really think that he wanted to believe, um, and, and he, there was something about Jesus that he was trying to find every avenue to try to, to you know, make this not guilty verdict stick, uh, but the people were just insistent um, that he was guilty and to crucify him. So I think against his better judgment, he, he went at the wishes of the people, and he ordered that Jesus is crucified. And some might ask, well, why, why crucifixion? But uh, you know, Jesus wasn't a Roman citizen, and if you're not a Roman citizen and you're a criminal, that was the form of what they did for execution. And you know, one of the ways that Pilate tried to have the people see it his way is he had Jesus whipped and flogged. So on top of everything else, tired and everything, going back and forth between the king and the governor, he is then whipped and flogged. And that wasn't good enough for the people. So after going through all of that, he is then led through this long trek up to Golgotha where he is then crucified between two criminals. And I wonder what he was thinking when he was walking to where he knew he was dying and what was going through his, his, his brain. I mean, he was physically tired, but to know what, what was on, what was going to happen, but, you know, after all of this, then he goes through hours, even more hours, on the cross of more excruciating pain to only die by suffocation. And then he breathed his last breath on the cross. How is that a good Friday? We say that this is a good Friday. But I want you to, to, to remove yourself from what we know happens afterwards, what, why we call it Good Friday. And I want you to put yourself in the place of the disciples and of Mary. This could have caused some serious doubt in them. You know, uh, they had no idea that he was going to resurrect later. I mean, Jesus, you know, dropped things here and there, but, you know, he talked in parables all the time, and things went over the disciples' heads all the time. So this was probably no different. And, you know, resurrection wasn't really a thing back then. It really isn't a thing now. So that was really far from their thoughts. And... They didn't really even understand what the Last Supper was either. And I think right now with us, we are dealing with kind of a Good Friday moment in our lives and in society and everything that's going on because of what this virus has done to our lives and put us in a complete standstill. I, I can imagine that Mary and, and the disciples that when Jesus died, their life literally stopped in that moment, you know, and and, you know, we can't see the other side of what's going on with this, this virus. And please hear me, I, I'm aware and I know how serious this is, but it can't consume us. They could have let the death of Jesus just consume them with grief and confusion, um, but they didn't. 
you know, when we look around our world right now, with everything that's going on, there isn't much hope to see. And I think the same could have been said for Mary and the disciples, that they, you know, the Jesus that was supposed to be their Messiah is now dead. Um, you know, where's the hope in this? You know, you don't understand this. And as a mother, I couldn't even imagine losing a child, much less in this way, to watch him being crucified. And, you know, and Mary knew the prophecy that was spoken about her son. And she even knew how he was conceived. So she knows this, but yet there's this clash that's happening between reality and what her faith is saying. And I think that might be happening to us as well. You know, there's this reality of what is going on in the world and what our faith says. And, you know, I wonder what was going on in Mary's mind during this time. I wonder what the disciples were thinking of. They had staked their lives on this man. And yet, I mean, they gave up their jobs. They left, you know, their family for this man. And now they have nothing to show for it. He's gone. And, you know, you might be having one of those moments right now, if we're honest with ourselves, where our, our reality is the very contrary to our faith right now. Maybe you've been praying interceding and saying, you know, this virus has got to go. And then you wake up every morning and it's still here. And it feels like your prayers are just hitting the ceiling and bouncing back at you. You know, we don't know what is happening in back then and the Good Friday, the three-day waiting period they had, or our three-week period that we have here, or three months or whatever this is going to take. But whatever the time amount, we must tarry. And we have to have faith that God is still on the throne and that he is in control, even though we don't see the whole picture. Mary didn't see the whole picture. The disciples didn't see the whole picture. The the Jewish council didn't see the whole picture. You see, now we know what's on the other side of this Easter story and how it ended, at least for now, for Jesus. But hindsight's always 20-20, right? Uh, We can see this clearly now, but, but living then, now we are living in something very similar now. It looks bleak. It looks hopeless for us now, just like it did for them. You know, right before his death, the scriptures mentioned that a veil was torn in the temple. And, and I think sometimes we read over that, and depending on where you're at in your walk with, with the Lord, understanding what that exactly meant. You see, the temple had three parts. And there was the courts, which is where all the people could, could come. And then there was the holy place, which was for the priest. To enter, and then there was the Holy of Holies, and that's where only the high priest could go. The people couldn't go there, the priests couldn't go there, only the holy priest could go there. And when Jesus died on the cross, he tore the veil that separated that Holy of Holies. He made a way for us to enter into God's presence through Jesus Christ whenever we wanted. We didn't have to hold a certain title or, or anything. We were we were made, uh, we were cleansed and, and made restored and whole to be able to come to him you know and they didn't even know then that when Jesus died on that cross he really died as the lamb for the Passover meal that they were having that evening you know not a not a broken bone could be had in these sacrificial lambs that they had for the Passover and the same was with Jesus he was the lamb of God and he was the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world and you know there's in this story there's there's these key players and there's these kind of the people who are in the in the, the limelight but then there's some that are kind of behind the scenes and, and two of those people in this story is joseph and nicodemus and uh they were members of the jewish council those are the people who who arrested jesus and and, and had him crucified brought him before pilate and everything and these two they throughout the story they are, you can tell that they believe who Jesus says he is, but yet they're part of this Jewish council and they can't kind of go against with what their council is standing for and, and what Jesus is saying who he is. And um, they are kind of like closet Christians at this moment, but um, when Jesus died, they both went and they asked, what are you guys going to do with his body? Because we want to make sure that he gets a proper burial. So you see, when we are confronted with Jesus' death, we should be changed to believe, to proclaim, and to act. And that's what they did, and they did it with boldness. I mean, I don't think we understand what they were doing being a part of the Jewish council and then going against them and basically going to bat for Jesus here, even after he was gone. 
even when all hope was gone and, and it seems like he had been defeated in this. You know, and, and, and they did this with boldness, which is what Pastor Kyle has been talking about on Wednesdays with this teachings is, is how do we be bold during this time? And Nicodemus and Joseph are a great example of that. You know, Nicodemus tried to defend Jesus um, during the secret chi- trial, excuse me, and then both of them took Jesus to the tomb where later they couldn't find him, um, uh, uh, you know, a couple of days later, but they made sure that he was properly buried. You know, on, on Good Friday and the days leading up to the resurrection, it's kind of where we're at now in our lives. It's this place of limbo and of uncertainty. Um, what we do with this time is really up to us, just like it was up to the disciples and Mary and everyone around that situation, what they did during this time too. And, you know, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was probably full of uncertainty during this time. She was hurt, she was grieving, um, and she was probably confused. And she did, only, she did only what she knew what she could do in that moment, and that was put one foot in front of the other and do what she needed to do. You see, she had planned to go, and there was intentionality there, and that's important that we get that, that she had already made plans to go and basically pay her respects to Jesus at the tomb. But in her doing that, in her seeking to go see Jesus, it led her to Jesus and then the miraculous that happened and what she found at the tomb. What if she had stayed at home and had a pity party for herself? What would have happened? Because it's important that women even, I mean, that's a whole other sermon, that they were the ones who found the tomb empty. But what are you doing during your waiting time here? Um, during this time of uncertainty or doubt or any other emotions that you're feeling during this quarantine time that we're in, what are we doing with that time? Are we accepting it for what it is and that we can't do anything about it? Or are we doing what we need to do each and every day and, and that we're intentionally seeking Jesus? You know, I hope that your Good Friday is indeed good um, in this time of uncertainty that you rest in that the miracle Uh, The breakthrough is coming, that it's always darkest before dawn. And we just need to hold on and we need to trust that our big, miraculous, great, divine, resurrecting Savior has something that he is working behind the scenes. And we just need to press in and so that we need to just go deeper in our walk more than we ever have before. That's what we need to take out of this Good Friday. You know, let's go ahead and pray as we... Father, we just thank you for what this night, this day represents, Father, everything that you went through, you know, the the physical part of it, Lord, the emotional part of it, Lord, but we are so thankful for what is to come, Father, what is, what comes with that resurrection Sunday, but Father, in this waiting room, Lord, that we're in, Lord, when, when things around us in the world that we're in now seems bleak and hopeless and confusing, Lord, that we would be anchored in you, that we would know that we just need to dig in and we need to know that our faith needs to to be over what we see with our eyes, because that's what faith is, is what we can't see. And Father, that we would just press in during this time and that we would, it would lead us to you and that we can look back on this and that it was a time that we grew closer to you and that we had revelation, Lord, and that uh, however this thing pans out, Lord, but that you're in it that you're working on our behalf, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for what this weekend represents and for you sending your son for us. May we always remember it, Lord, and may this weekend especially that we would be reminded of of how blessed we are, Lord, and undeserving we were for you to send your son. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, and if you want to read more about the Good Friday account um, in your own devotional time, you can check it out in the Gospels. It's in Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, or John 18 and 19. And I hope that you are blessed by this. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in with us, for celebrating Good Friday with us, for remembering everything that Jesus has done for us. Come on, isn't he good? Yes. Come on, won't you go ahead and worship him wherever you're at right now? Won't you give him a big shout? Won't you look at a, someone around you and just say, man, Jesus is so good.
Hey, we love you guys. God bless you. Tune in Sunday. Sunday is going to be uh, awesome. We get ready to celebrate Easter, the risen Savior. We celebrated his death tonight, but Sunday is coming. And we're going to celebrate the risen Savior, uh, Jesus. We've got something for your kiddos, for uh, those under uh, kindergarten and younger. We'll be at 9 o'clock. Uh, Miss Courtney's going to have something for them. Uh, Pastor Zach has got something at 930 have our main uh, online worship experience at 10 a.m. Uh, tune in here on Facebook or on YouTube. We have the YouTube channel, so tune in to those places. But we love each and every one of you. We miss you dearly. Yes. We can't wait to get back together again. Uh, but for right now, this is what we have. And uh, God bless you all. We love you. Hope you have an amazing rest of your evening. We'll see you.